It's, uh, it's an interesting topic to, for me today. It's interesting we should be winding up our, thank you, Danny, winding up our discussion on freedom from discord this week when the whole world seems to be in discord, right? It's been so interesting. I mean, we have total dysfunctional discord in Congress, and we have the UK nearly equally divided on whether to leave the European Union or stay, and we have preachers celebrating the slaughter in Orlando while the rest of us are holding our guts because we're in such grief and shock. It, it seems like the whole world is filled with discord at this moment. But, but almost a hundred years ago, in the 1920s, our founder Ernest Holmes wrote this. He said, I believe the ultimate goal of life is to be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. There are two really important things about that statement that I just want to raise up for you. The first is that he didn't say the ultimate goal of life was happiness, or love, or peace. He said it was emancipation from discord. And I think the reason it's, well, I'll get to why it's important <clears throat> later. The, other, the second point is, it's an evolutionary thing. We're all evolving toward emancipation from discord. It's an evolutionary process with a certain end, according to Holmes. And some days I just want people to hurry up and evolve. <laughs> you know? I just want everybody to hurry up so that we can get to this place where we're not at each other's throats quite so much. But evolution has its own pace. Biological evolution is to us, glacially slow. Social evolution is faster, but it still takes a long time to <coughs> percolate and permeate and bring everyone to the same place. And this particular idea, freedom from discord, has seemed to percolate maybe more slowly than others. It has reached comparatively few over the thousands of years that we've been here on this planet, but it, it is fundamental, I think, to what's called enlightenment or God consciousness or liberation or whatever else you want to call it. This thing that we're here doing, growing in awareness of spirit and of ourselves. It's also fundamental because when we have achieved it, when we achieve freedom from discord, we automatically experience love and peace and joy and contentment. It's like we strip away all the extra and find our true selves, and there we are with nothing but joy. It's all that's left. We've had a lot of way showers, a lot of mystics, a lot of great teachers and sages tell us that to uncover our true nature, we have to free ourselves of discord. The, the Buddhist whole teaching was life is suffering, but there's a way out. And life is suffering because we're overly attached to the things and the circumstances and the way things pan out. So when something happens to rattle our attachment, we feel discord. And Jesus, of course, taught over and over things like, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. And if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, offer them the other one. And First Peter, I love this particular verse. I'm not a big Bible thumper, but parts of it are really meaningful to me, and this is one of them. All of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Give a blessing instead. Wow. Well, it should be obvious that we cannot be peacemakers if we're living from conflict and discord. It should be obvious that we were not about to turn the other cheek when we're in righteous anger, are we? We won't do that. It, and, and, and so these words call us to start where we are and to figure out how to allow ourselves to become peaceful and harmonious and kind-hearted. The sage Krishnamurti wrote, to understand conflict, you must understand yourself. And it's a failure, I think, to understand who and what we really are that keeps us 
in conflict. It's a failure to, to see that we're not the outer appearances. We're not the facts and circumstances. We're the facts and circumstances and things and people around us don't cause our happiness or unhappiness or our freedom or our bondage. And neither do they define us. And, and I think it's that failure to keep that in our hearts and minds that keeps us stuck in conflict. But when we come to understand who we are, that we're the link, we're the link between inner and outer, we're the link between heaven and earth, if you will. We're the, we're the manifestation of the one life of the universe. And that we're the creators of our own life experience. Then we start to loosen the bonds of conflict. We start to be able to move through life free of conflict. And that's not to say we'll never experience conflict. Life is filled with opportunities to experience conflict. What happens most, most often is that we grab the conflict and put it on like clothes or jewelry and show it around. Yeah. Do you like my conflict? This is a nice one. I got, just got this one the other day, right? <laughs> we wear them too proudly and we tell people about them and we worry about how they'll turn out and we want to win. We want to win everything all the time. And that's perpetuating the conflict that we started with. It, it actually makes it bigger than it ever was. So how do we end the bondage? How do we free ourselves from this near constant experience of conflict and discord? Krishnamurti again, he said, to be free of conflict, we must treat ourselves and others as we would treat our beloved children, instead of judging them and treating them harshly, we endlessly observe them with love and with patience and with kindness. And that includes ourselves. And we try to find solutions to problems that meet everyone's needs, not just <coughs> winning. We try to meet everyone's needs and we find out what those needs are simply by observing with eyes of love and patience rather than eyes of judgment and impatience and anger. And this is something I am always catching myself in, particularly right now. When I feel myself getting angry or looking down my nose at someone or judging them to be stupid or thinking they don't know they took us from third base, then I have to stop and observe. Observe some more. Move, move from judgment and anger into a place of kindness and patience. I have to tell you, it's not easy. I'm getting a real workout right now. Carol Boyer said a couple weeks ago, it ain't easy, and she was right. But it seems to me this is the path to liberation from conflict. When a pastor tells his congregation that he's glad 49 gay people were slaughtered, Love and kindness and patience are not my first reaction. They're just not. But love and kindness and patience can be my first response if I will just stop in that moment of reaction and let the reaction go and say, what is it I want to experience in the world? What kind of world do I want to see happening? What what would a world that works for everyone look like in this circumstance? Then my response can be a lot kinder and more open because I realize that not only am I evolving, but so, so, so help me God, so is that pastor and so is this congregation. They're just stuck somewhere. They're just stuck somewhere. We're all on different parts of this evolutionary spiral. And yet I want to pause to tell you a little story about a Buddhist nun who was in India with a friend of hers and they were in a rickshaw and they were attacked by a man and they escaped without injury. But the nun was very upset by her reaction. And so she went to her teacher and said, what would a proper Buddhist response have been? And the teacher said, you should have 
very mindfully and with great compassion, whacked him on the head with your umbrella. <laughs> And I raise that because we are not to be passive victims, but neither are we to, to be reactionary, angry, conflict bringers, right? Notice she said, very mindfully and with great <laughs> compassion. You protect yourself, but not, not with anger and, and hatred in your umbrella hand. So the first response is to open myself to the possibility that these people are evolving too. The second response is how can I how can I behave in a way that reaches a hand out to help somebody kind of move up a rung maybe or or to give them the opportunity to, to think differently rather than casting them in my mind into outer darkness, which is what I my, my reaction tells me to do? How can I remember in myself and then perhaps communicate that anytime I make anyone other than I am, anytime I put someone in a category that separates them from me, that's a reaction coming from the primitive part of my brain and not my heart. So how can I give myself that moment to respond from the heart instead? How can I lovingly maybe help someone move from a place of blind hatred and judgment into seeing the possibility of a different response? How can I do that? It's in between the reaction and the response that our work lies. In between the reaction and the response is the only place we can change our experience of the world. It's the only place we can change what we do and how we think and what we say. It's the only place we can free ourselves from the bondage to conflict. And I think it's the highest use of the human will we can make. I, do, I truly do. I think if we can use our will to stop in that moment of pause after the reaction and before the, before the response and allow ourselves to just stop and say, what, how do I want to experience this and what do I want to see myself do in the world, we will over time become free because our, our response will become our instinctive reaction. If we can pause and use our will to call forth the divine that lives within us and speak and act from that, the conflict disappears. The Sufi poet wrote that the, lin the Rumi wrote that the linchpin of all of this is, is an active moral imagination, a peaceful versus a warring imagination, and a harmonious versus a destructive imagination. An active moral imagination is compassion, right? It reminds us that we're all one. It reminds us that we are equal in the eyes of God, every single one of us, and that we're all in this together. We're all in it together. We can't possibly cast anyone into outer darkness because they're part of who we are. I mean, we're, if we're all one, they're part of us. As much as we'd like to get rid of them, they are part of, of this thing we call humanity. So an active moral imagination is compassion. A peaceful imagination reminds us that it's freedom from conflict that brings us joy and peace and love. And a harmonious imagination enables us to look for solutions that meet all of the needs that are present, not just ours or not just those we like, but everybody's. Rumi wrote this little poem that I just love. He's, he wrote, I will soothe you and heal you. I will bring you roses. I, too, have been covered with thorns. I love that. It speaks so much of true compassion, feeling with another. It describes the decision that's made from that highest use of will and imagination to, to bring roses to the one who is hurting. Not so we'll look good, but because we, too, have been covered with thorns. Because we, too understand the pain 
of being caught on the thorns of our own pride or our own greed or our own bias or our own attachment to winning. And we know the possibility of bringing roses, of being the bearer of healing. We're all in this together. We're all on that evolutionary path towards freedom from conflict and, and discord. And even if we feel ourselves to be higher up on the spiral, our own advancement can never separate us from anyone who might be down there somewhere or anyone who might be up there somewhere. We can, and I think we have to be careful to make sure that we're not that we're being honest with ourselves about where we are. Because in one area, I may be up here, and in another, I may be way down here. That's how we, that's how we do this thing. One piece of us moves up and drags the others along really slowly, <laughs> really slowly sometimes. We can stop and remind ourselves always of what the Buddha said, no step on the spiritual path, whether it's my step or your step, no step is ever wasted. It may be that that those, you know, according to the Bodhisattva idea, those who have evolved the farthest and the soonest, we may have to wait until the very slowest one is ready. And then we all join hands and cross the, the, the strip or threshold of, to enlightenment. Who knows? Nobody knows how it happens. But, but I do know that we have to free ourselves and then reach out in our hearts to those who are still stuck, who are still trapped. And we can only do that from that place of deep compassion and open-heartedness and never from judgment or hatred or discord. In the prophet Khalil Gibran wrote, when one of you falls down, he falls for those behind him. A caution against the stumbling stone. I, and he falls for those ahead of him, who though faster and surer of foot, yet removed not the stumbling stone. Whether we're beginners or advanced trekkers on the path, it's up to us to watch out for those stones and to remove them if we stumble on them and notice, to pay attention so that we can remove them from the path of those who may be behind us. And it's ours to remember that we carry each other with us. We all, we all help each other on this path. And that we only get free from conflict through love. Through love. I think that is the highest purpose we can serve in this universe. So I ran across this little piece from George Bernard Shaw yesterday, and I want to close with it because I thought it was absolutely beautiful. He was a playwright, great playwright, and he wrote... This is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force of nature, instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, <laughs> complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <laughs> I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So let's together make it burn brightly more brightly than ever before. And join me, if you will, in turning within for a moment. From this interior awareness, I know that there is only one. There is only one life, one power, one presence in which we all abide and from which we draw breath that thing we call God, that power and passion and love and joy and peace and health and abundance that we call God. It is in us. It is all around us. It is everywhere present in every moment of time. It is that which created out of its own being all that exists. 
and that enlivens everything and continues to create moment by moment, day by day, year by year, changing form, experiencing everything there is to experience. And through all of it, its constant is love, boundless, infinite, unconditional, bottomless love. And as I breathe in that love, I know that it is that love that wakes me in the morning. It is that love that guides me during the day. It is that love that pulses in every member and friend and guest and, and, and attendee of this center and this community. It is that love that brings us the peace and the joy and the abundance and the well-being that we all seek. That love is our good. And knowing this to be the truth about us, I know that we find it easier every day to cast off the discord and to step into that place of compassion and love, to reach out a hand to those who may be struggling, a hand of love and peace, not a hand of judgment or hatred a hand that helps to create that world of our vision, that world that works for all life, where all know they are children of the divine, where all know that they are loved, that world of freedom and joy. And as I know this to be the truth about each one of us here, I say thank you. I express my gratitude for this mad, wild, crazy, wonderful adventure we call human life. For all the companions on the road, for all those who hold out their hand to me, and for all those to whom I hold out a hand, I say thank you. And from this place of deep gratitude, I simply let go. I release these words knowing that that universe always says yes to us that it turns to us even before we turn to it with the resounding, yes, my beloved. So I simply let it go, knowing it's already so. And we say together, and so it is.
we now have an opportunity to give in support of the work of our community. I'd like to just take a moment with you to remember what we know about giving. You know, it's the thing that puts us in touch with the ab abundance of life. And when we let ourselves give from the place of gratitude, and we take the time to remember how blessed we are, and we're giving from a place of fullness and love, and the universe, like always, says yes to more abundance. We are, we are stepping into living more abundantly. So I invite you now to just take a moment to become grateful, to count your blessings, to think of someone or something that you are so grateful for. When we give from gratitude, our giving accomplishes miracles. And then it returns to us multiplied, pressed down, and overflowing. So please know with me, my heart is open. My heart is open. I give from my open heart. I give from my open heart. I know that as I give, I am given to. I know that as I give, I am given to. And I am grateful. And I am grateful. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's wonderful, wonderful. And thank you, Higher Mind Band, as always. You are amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So a couple of quick announcements. Uh, our first class of ministerial students will be here in just over two months. Woo! I can hardly believe it. And they're coming from all over the place, New Jersey, D.C., all over the place. And so we're looking for just another couple of people who might be able to house a student for a couple of weekends during fall term. If you can do that, there's a sign-up sheet over on the bulletin board, and I'll get in touch with you, and we'll work out something that works for your life. I really appreciate it. I'm just trying to make it easy on, because I remember having to fly to San Diego and, and staying in hotels and, and all of that cost. It made, made it cost a lot more than it needed to. So, Gary Victor, where are you? Yeah. Gary Victor has an announcement about an event that's coming up this afternoon. If you dare. If you dare. <laughs> okay, not to worry, guys. I'm not going to throw anything at you. Okay, like uh, last month. There's always a crazy guy in the congregation, so I'm the crazy guy. So, Mark Coltrane is a pretty good guy at teaching props. Remember Mark talking Water about? Balloons. Yeah. So we have a couple events today. Uh, actually one event. Um, we have a hike at Siebenthaler Fen, which is in Beaver Creek, a neat place, kind of like a, a plant safari that starts at two o'clock. So see me or Kelly for details. I'll be here afterward if you want to embark on that. It'll be very warm. This is about a two mile hike. And it's on a boardwalk, so it's flat. And it's um, a neat adventure. You'll actually see uh, rare plant species in this walk. So it's kind of cool. That's at 2 o'clock today. So dress accordingly. It'll be very warm. And then on Saturday, July 16th, we have an annual canoe outing at uh, Bellbrook Canoe Livery. Yeah. So, uh, and we will have a picnic with that. So there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. So this is about a five-mile uh, canoe outing and uh, with a picnic afterward. So if you have any questions, see me or Kelly O'Keefe. Kelly, could you stand up, please? All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's right next to my house. Yeah, we'll go to your house afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, and I really appreciate no squirt guns. That's good. Uh, aww. <laughs> aww. <laughs> and now for the other half, Becky Victor. This is uh, this is from the Leadership Council. It's a thank you for all that you do and have done for our center. I'm so grateful to you. Yay. Thank you, Becky. We love you. Thank you. Let's see, Linda Andriaco, who is our treasurer and a brand new grandma. I mean, Yay! brand new. Brand new as of Friday. Has a couple words she wants to say to you as well. Congratulations. Actually, yesterday morning, 
Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Reverend Cece said about um, abundance and prosperity and commitment. And we're halfway through the year. We are a little bit behind on our tithing and um, we still have bills to pay. So as you head out on your vacations, have fun times, think of the church, think of what you can do to help us keep on budget and keep everything flowing the way it needs to flow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Darlene. So the last, as I said, the last page of the bulletin insert has a whole bunch of uh, upcoming events, and there's two more that I want to just remind you of. One is uh, a workshop for women on Saturday, August 6th with Reverend Cynthia James, and if you saw her last time, you know how fabulous she is. The, the price of admission is simply to buy a copy of her book, which we have, and it's a brand new book, Hot Off the Press. This is doing extremely well on, um, on what's that thing, Amazon. Um, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful workshop, I know. And just know you'll get a postcard about this, too. But September 25th, we will be celebrating our 70th anniversary wow. of being in the Miami Valley here. So Dr. Ken Gordon, our spiritual leader from Centers for Spiritual Living, our whole organization, will be here, and he'll be speaking at the service, and then we'll have a luncheon afterwards, and we'll get to hang out with him. He's an amazing guy. So mark your calendar, September 25th. Don't miss it. More information will come to you as, as it becomes clear to us. How's that? <laughs> um, please join us in the Consciousness Cafe. There's a lot of uh, a lot of munchies and food in there, and there's also some Dorothy Lane bread for you to feel free to take home and use. Um, and birthday what? Oh, it's birthday Sunday. Thank you, thank you, thank you for reminding me. So we have cake, which is always a good thing, and fruit. <laughs> So our June birthdays, happy birthday to Lisa Schreiber, Joseph Widener, Dan Hefner, yay Dan, yeah. Sherry Buckner, Joy Dushak, Callie Brust, Catherine Lakin, Lawada Looper, and Scott Boggs. And I hope I didn't miss anybody, but if you were born in June, happy birthday to you too. Yeah. Happy birthday to all of you. <laughs> Join us for cake in the social hall. And finally, if there's some area of your life that you could use a little prayer support in, Please just walk up to any one of the practitioners. They're the ones wearing the, the teal or white prayer shawls and ask for prayer. And they are happy to give this gift to you on Sunday. We call it a one-minute miracle. And um, she's, a, she's a good model, too. And then if you're having a really difficult time, you can actually make an appointment with one of the practitioners for a full session. I think you'll be pretty amazed at, at what can get loosened up and changed in, in that short time. Thank you for ev to everybody who made this service possible, our ushers and greeters, our kids, our youth uh, um, teachers in the back, our practitioners, the welcome team, the Consciousness Cafe team, the Higher Mind Band, Margaret Owens, mm -hmm. and all of you. I love you. Thank you so much. Let's give ourselves a hand, shall we? <laughs> and let's do our closing affirmation, and then our closing song, which is A Light in the World. Am I correct? Good. A Light in the World. Oh, today I pause. Today I pause. Breathe. Breathe. And, respond. and respond. I give love. I give love. Kindness. Kindness. And patience. And patience. I look for the larger answer. I look for the larger answer. I am peace. I am peace. And so it is. And so it is. Have a truly fabulous week. You too. Thank you. Thank you.